Space weapons have been blamed for a lot of things recently, from forest fires to Havana Syndrome. Let's evaluate one of these possibilities. Havana Syndrome was first reported in late 2016, when American and Canadian diplomats in Havana, Cuba, complained of a strange combination of medical symptoms. Many of my favorite debunking channels have doubted the existence of this phenomenon. I would be more skeptical also if the U.S. State Department had not referred to them as unexplained health incidents or UHIs, while the CIA has publicly stated that they are attacks. Understand that the U.S. government marched American soldiers through the immediate fallout of a nuclear blast with no protective gear, then studied their rate of illness and death. When some of these soldiers sued for compensation, the events were denied until almost all of the soldiers were dead. In short, the U.S. government does not like to compensate its citizens for on-the-job injuries. The fact that the government was acknowledging that these were attacks caught my attention. The symptoms experienced included a sudden onset of ringing in the ears or hearing a grating sound, followed by a sensation in the head of pressure or vibration. These lasted 20 to 30 minutes and were perceived as coming from a specific direction. It always occurred when the diplomats were alone, either at home or in a hotel room. People in adjoining rooms did not report the same problems. These attacks seem to cause some permanent brain injury and have since been reported in many other locations. In 2018, these attacks were announced by the press. And in 2019, the Journal of the American Medical Association evaluated the attacks. The medical experts could not come to a complete consensus on the possible cause though the idea of a microwave weapon was thought most probable. This was also the conclusion of an investigation completed in 2021. A recent newspaper article opined that the weapon was most likely space-based, or possibly fired from an airplane. Let's evaluate this supposition. If you watched the lesson on power beams, you would know that projecting energy from space is very difficult, especially from a geosynchronous orbit. The formula was theta equals lambda, over pi times w, where w is the aperture width. If a satellite was in a very low Earth orbit, let's say 200 kilometers, and it projected a coherent microwave energy beam, or maser, with a wavelength of at least one millimeter, so as to be in the atmospheric microwave window, through a five millimeter aperture, the formula tells us that the beam divergence would be 0.063662, if we project that down from an altitude of 200 kilometers, we get a 12.7 meter or 42.33 foot radius beam. That gives us an area of over 500 square meters, or about 815,000 square feet. Let's project this over the Havana Embassy for scale. Here is the embassy, and here is the radius of the projected beam. This is too big to target a single room. You would want to avoid this because one person reporting something odd has a lot less validity than two people reporting it. You can't use a smaller wavelength or it would be absorbed by the atmosphere. We can use a larger aperture. If we increase the aperture size to 25 millimeters, we can get our radius down to only about 2.5 meters. This is what that would look like. This could work in targeting a single room, though we would still have the upper and lower floor problem. Now let's consider power. The average American microwave is about 0.0425 cubic meters in volume. A good one will have 1,000 watts of power. Let's use that for comparison. 1,000 watts divided by 0.0425 cubic meters gives us 23,529 watts per cubic meter. If our projected circle is only 2.5 meters in radius, it would have an area of a little more than 20 square meters. If the room is three meters or 10 feet tall, I'm just making some estimates here, I know many rooms are only eight feet tall. To have the same power concentration as an average microwave would require 4.7 megawatts of power to be projected into that volume in that room. A really good solar panel can harvest less than one third of the solar energy that strikes it. Solar energy at the orbit of the earth is 1,373 watts per square meter. That leaves us with about 400 watts per square meter we would need almost 12,000 square meters of solar panels in orbit to produce 4.7 megawatts. And this is assuming 
that the projected beam is 100% efficient at getting the power from the satellite into the volume in the room. This would not be the case. The size of the solar panel required would be a square 108 meters times 108 meters, or more than four times the size of the solar panels on the ISS. Someone might notice that you had put that in orbit. It would be possible to use supercapacitors to store energy, but to create a continuous beam for 30 minutes is not feasible. It is possible that the beam pulses and that the effect lasts 20 to 30 minutes. But remember, everyone reported a directionality. This brings up another issue. At an altitude of 200 kilometers, the satellite would have an Earth horizon of 1,634 kilometers. It takes a satellite at that altitude about 90 minutes to complete an orbit around the Earth. The Earth's circumference is about 40,000 kilometers, so the satellite would be going about 26,700 kilometers per hour. That means it would only have about 3.7 minutes from when it came over the horizon to project a beam before it passed over the other horizon. You would need a higher orbit to slow your orbital speed and increase your visible horizon. But then you would dramatically increase your beam divergence. Now what if you projected the beam from an aircraft? If an aircraft were flying at 10 kilometers, about the altitude of commercial flights, you could get your beam radius down to 12.7 centimeters. Let's say you adjust it to a 3 meter radius, which is a circle about 20 feet across. That would be an area of a little more than 28 square meters. A 3 meter tall room would produce a volume of 85 cubic meters. That would require a power of about 2 megawatts. An airplane the size of a commercial jet could carry the equipment necessary to produce that much power. You would still have the problem of it affecting other people in upper or lower floors from your target and you would have to circle this target area to stay within range and keep it focused on a single room. Adjusting the beam as the plane flew would be easily possible with today's technology. But the reports have been that there was a clear single direction from which the beam seemed to come, and no reports of that direction shifting. Projected microwave beams can be ground-based. The United States has produced this device. This generates and focuses microwaves onto human beings. The microwaves cause the skin to register an extremely high temperature, making the person feel that their skin is being burned away. This was designed to disperse crowds, but blindness and cataracts must be considered, as well as the ethics of making people feel like they are being boiled alive. Could a device like this be used on the ground? It could indeed. It would even be possible to project two beams, both of which are harmless, but where they cross, an interference pattern would form causing some waves to be canceled out, while others were amplified. The area of amplification could be adjusted to create harmful microwave radiation in just one location. This would require powerful projectors at specific distances to the target, and would increase the risk of exposure, as getting the equipment on the ground or into nearby buildings might be noticed. These beams would not be completely undetectable, however, whether from space, an airplane, or the ground. Any time you fire an energy beam through an atmosphere, there is some scatter from dust and gas molecules. A sensitive camera designed for microwave frequencies could detect this scatter and identify the source. What should be done if someone is caught using a device like this? These events have seemed to cause permanent injury in some. And if anyone is out there using a microwave weapon on civilians, it is a despicable and cowardly method of attack but we have seen several nations use nerve agents and radioactive poisons on civilians in the last few years. And the United States' recent torture of captives, I think it's time for a new Geneva Convention, so we can clarify what is still illegal under international law. If it is a nation carrying out these assaults, it should be seen as an act of war. Even in warfare, the use of weapons like this should be forbidden. Many types of weapons are banned in warfare, from lasers that blind to chemical and biological agents. We need to add beamed energy weapons as off-limits and then collectively enforce these bans. As technology progresses, we will all have to work together and be vigilant to ensure a bright future for our descendants. Thank you very much for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and help us out on Patreon if you can. Don't forget we have gear in the Academy Store at Astro Proterra.
U.S. intelligence says publicly there is no credible evidence that an adversary is inflicting brain injuries on national security officials. And yet, more than 100 Americans have symptoms that scientists say could be caused by a beam of microwaves or acoustic ultrasound. This month, the National Institutes of Health reported results of brain scans. NIH said there's no evidence of physical damage. But the medical science of so-called anomalous health incidents remains vigorously debated. For its part, the Director of National Intelligence says the symptoms probably result from pre-existing conditions, conventional illnesses, and environmental factors. Attorney Mark Zaid represents more than two dozen AHI clients. What do you make of the intelligence community assessment? So I've had access to classified information relating to AHI. I can't reveal it. I wouldn't reveal it. I will tell you that I don't believe it to be the entire story. And I know of information that undermines or contradicts what they are saying publicly. His study found directed pulsed radio frequency energy appears to be the most plausible mechanism. For example, a focused beam of microwaves or acoustic ultrasound. More than 100 officials or family members have unexplained persistent symptoms. Now, for the first time, the case of FBI agent Kerry suggests which adversary might be responsible. She spoke with the FBI's permission, but wasn't allowed to discuss the cases she was on when she was hit. We have learned from other sources, one of those cases involved this Mustang going 110 miles an hour. Pull over, pull over. In 2020, near Key West, Florida, deputies tried to stop the Mustang for speeding. It ran 15 miles until it hit spike strips laid in its path. A search of the car found notes of bank accounts. Citibank. Yeah, Discover saving uh, 75000 And this device that looks like a walkie-talkie can erase the car's computer data, including its GPS record. There was also a Russian passport. What's your first name? Vitaly. V-I-T-A-L-I-I. -I. Vitaly Kovalev was the driver from St. Petersburg, Russia, not Florida. Why did you run? Let me be honest with you. I don't know. You don't know why you ran? I don't know. And we don't know why he ran, but what we learned suggests he was a Russian spy. Over months, he spent 80 hours being interviewed by FBI agent Kerry, who had investigated multiple Russian spies. Kerry says she was hit in Florida, and a year later when she awoke to the same symptoms in the middle of the night in California. It felt like I was stuck in this state of like disorientation, not able to function, like what is happening, and my whole body was pulsing. Vitaly Kovalev served his time and in 2022 went back to Russia, ignoring American warnings that he was in danger because he'd spent so much time with the FBI. Christo Grozev found this death certificate from last year which says Kovalev was killed at the front in Ukraine. I have CIA and State Department clients as well who believe they've been impacted domestically. There are dozens of CIA cases that have happened domestically that is at least believed. She is the wife of a Justice Department official who was with the embassy in Tbilisi. She's a nurse with a PhD in anesthesiology. On October 7, 2021, she says that she was in her laundry room when she was blindsided by a sound. As I'm reaching into the dryer, um, I am 
completely consumed by a piercing sound that I can only describe as when you listen to a movie and the main character is also consumed by the sound after a bomb goes off, that is similar to the sound that I heard. And it just pierced my ears, came in my left side, felt like it came through the window into my left ear. I immediately felt fullness in my head and just a piercing headache. And when I realized that I needed to get out of the laundry room, I left the room and went into our bedroom next door and projectile vomited in our bathroom. We have learned that hers was the second incident that week. Sources tell us earlier in the neighborhood, a U.S. official, their spouse and child were hit. We have also learned of a phone call that was intercepted nearby. A man says in Russian, is it supposed to have blinking green lights? And should I leave it on all night? We have no idea what he was talking about, but the next day, the incidents began. Sources tell us that an investigation centered on this Russian, Albert Averyanov. His name, on travel manifests and phone records, appears alongside known members of Unit 29155. Grozev found Albert Averyanov's phone was turned off during the Tbilisi incidents, but our sources say there is evidence someone in Tbilisi logged into Averyanov's personal email during this time. Most likely, Grozev believes Averyanov himself placing him in the city. After you were able to get out of the laundry room, call your husband, what did you do then? I went downstairs. I first looked on our security camera, which is right beside our front door, to see if anyone was outside. There was a vehicle right outside of our gate. I took a photo of that vehicle and noticed that it was not a vehicle that I recognized, and I went outside. Did you see anyone around the vehicle? I did. We sent you a photograph of Albert Averyanov, and this is the picture that we sent you. You did. And I wonder if that looks anything like the man you saw outside your home. It absolutely does. She was medically evacuated, and now doctors say she has holes in her inner ear canals, the vestibular system that creates the sense of balance. Two surgeries put metal plates in her skull. Another surgery is likely. It's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. The Pentagon launched an investigation run by a recently retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. Greg Edgreen has never spoken publicly until now. Are we being attacked? My personal opinion, yes. By whom? Russia. As you heard in the previous briefing, clearly what had happened here is some type of sensory damage and some type of central damage. Was the sensory damage the cause of the central damage? Are these two things unrelated? What types of things do we see here? And what might be a viable vector for producing these effects? If you go to my second slide, we have is otopathology and ototoxicity. And let me define those words to you. Otopathology means damage to the ear. Ototoxicity is some toxic effect to the ear. We're looking at the ear. There's a number of different things that are there. Obviously, we have the cochlea, which is the hearing organ of the ear, but also nestled deep, as Dr. Hopper explained to you, within that same vestibule are the balance organs, semicircular canals, the utriculus, and the saccule. And these are, in fact, connected. What are the signs and symptoms that you would get with otopathology and or ototoxicity? You've heard some of them already. Hearing loss or changes in the ability to hear, ringing in the ear, tinnitus, vertigo and disequilibrium, nausea, visual features such as you had, problems with saccades, nystagmus, autolopsia, headache could be gradual, sudden, might be one-sided or two-sided, can be temporary, could be durable. Next slide, please. If you then go to possible vectors to induce these effects, a number of things could do it. Drugs could do it. Devices could do it. Of the drugs that could do this, the short list is antibiotics, loop diuretics, drugs that are used for certain forms of chemotherapy like cisplatin and carboplatin, high doses of salicylates, that's aspirin, certain heavy metals, most notably mercury and lead, organic solvents. 
Might technology also be able to do? Yes, absolutely. We know that subsonic stimulation below 20 hertz can certainly do something like this, but realistically, that's very, very difficult to be able to propagate. Ultrasonic stimulation in around the range of 4,000 hertz, uh, 4,500 hertz, could certainly do this type of thing, as could electromagnetic pulse stimulation uh, along the same frequency might be microwave stimulation. What would the pathology be if you saw this? My background is as a neurotoxicologist, neuropathologist. A number of things. You see inflammation in and around the inner ear. You damage to the hair cells, both of the cochlea as well as the otolithic organs, the utricular saccule. You see membrane scarring as a consequence of this. And you see neurologic damage. The idea of engaging the nerves in such a heavy way would then get what's called excitotoxic postsynaptic effects, where now what you're doing is you're literally overblasting the nerves. And overblasting the nerves, you're then causing a change in their calcium metabolism. This would then cause something called excitotoxicity. We go to the next slide. Let me tell you what we're talking about here. We're talking about the organs of the inner ear. We see here the external the ear canal, the, what's called the auditory atus. This is on the upper left. And we can see the organ of hearing, called the cochlea. And then around the organ of hearing, the cochlea, you see what looks like loops. If we then take this down a little bit, we know that those are the areas that are dealing with balance. And there are essentially two main areas, one that is dealing with rotational balance, these are semicircular canals, and the other which is positional balance with regard to being upright, that is the utriculus and the saccule. What's interesting to note, and that you'll hear further from in Dr. Balaban's lecture, is that high-frequency stimulation would then overstimulate the base of the cochlea. The cochlea is what we call tonotopically tuned. In other words, the relative stiffness of the membrane of the cochlea responds to different wavelengths of sound, displacement of sound that would then cause fluid movement inside the cochlea. High frequency displaces, most notably, the base of the cochlea, and the base of the cochlea intersects with the vestibule, the area that also deals with the upright positional balance. But if we then take a look at what types of things might induce some of the neuropathological or neurocognitive changes, well, now we have to go back and take a look at perhaps damage to the balance organ. Certainly, these individuals heard something. They had some problems with regard to hearing, ringing in the ears, but they were profoundly affected by balance issues vertiginous defect, vertigo. Well, what types of things could, in fact, do this? Is it possible that just damage to the inner ear could induce cognitive changes? Yes, absolutely. As Dr. Hopper so eloquently put, the idea of having to work pretty hard to keep yourself in the upright when you have positional disturbances and when you're having a hard time being to maintain what is upright and what is not and the room is spinning can be not only disorienting, it can be cognitively dysfunctional. We had some training with pilots where we demonstrated putting people in a device which is referred to characteristically as a spin and puke and having them do a particular set of cognitive tasks becomes exceedingly difficult, not only when they're spinning, but also when they're tumbling with regard to their upright position. So we know that cognitive overload can occur as a consequence of positional reestablishment. Could we just be seeing an artifact of damage to the inner ear that then induces these cognitive signs and symptoms? Well, yes, could. But there may be something more to this. There may actually be damage more centrally. There may be damages then communicated to the brain. Well, how could that be? Could drugs do it? Yep, certainly some of the drugs that we see that may also have ototoxic effect, most notably heavy metals like mercury and lead, certain organic solvents, could certainly then induce a central nervous system pathology as well. What about the technologies that would induce these otopathologic effects? Could they also have some effect on the central nervous system? Yes, they could. And there is, in fact, a literature to suggest that sonic generators uh, electromagnetic pulse generators, and even things like nanoparticulates could, in fact, be vectored through the ear, through the sinuses, through the eyes, and have centralized effects by virtue of harmonic frequencies that would then disrupt the stabilization of structures and functions of the brain. Well, how might we do this? Let's go to the next slide that says mechanisms of effect. And what I really need you to note here is the functional anatomy. The inner ear is nestled next to, anatomically nestled next to, the intimate lining of the brain and actually communicates with the fluid medium of the brain number of different ways this can happen. Obviously, if we're looking at something like an ultrasonic stimulating device or an electromagnetic pulse device, the idea of focus cavitation and fluid media certainly is conducted within the ear. And by making it conducted within the ear, it can then communicate to the brain space. It can communicate to the brain space through a number of different mechanisms. If we take a look at the next slide, one is something called perilymph. Perilymph is the fluid that is the medium of conductance within the inner ear. And we also recognize that the entirety of that inner ear is bathed in this fluid, and that is the fluid medium by which things like balance, positional station, as well as hearing media can then be propagated. Obviously, as a fluid that has a particular viscosity, it's then subject to cavitation changes based upon the frequency of the stimulus that's applied to it. 
And if we take a look at what we might be seeing here with regard to the perilymph, one of the things that becomes very important to note is that the fluid of the inner ear directly communicates with the fluid that bathes the brain. There are two primary mechanisms by which this occurs. The one that would be most notable is something known as the cochlear aqueduct. We see it here in the upper left-hand portion of the slide talking about mechanisms of effect. This communicates directly with an area of the brain called the subarachnoid space, which is equally bathed in fluid. There's also a lesser aqueduct called the vestibular aqueduct, which is positionally located sort of around the back of that vestibule where the balance organs are. And what's important to note about both of these aqueducts is they create a venturi effect. So in the vestibule, where the balance organs are and where the initiation of the window to the cochlea is, that's a fairly large space, anatomically speaking. I mean, it's actually quite small in, in real terms, but it's a fairly large space. It represents something called a foyer. And if you then induce cavitation changes within that space, and you then communicate the cavitation into a smaller space, you're getting a venturi pipe effect. So you're increasing both the speed and the force by which those bubbles can then travel. Think of taking a large volume of water and funneling it down, literally into a funnel, into a hose. You know that there's an inverse relationship between volume, space, diameter, and pressure. So what we're then able to do is communicate this directly up into the brain space. What would happen there? Over on the right, you see what that brain space looks like. That brain space has sort of a, a membranous uh, quality to it, the, the arachnoidal membrane, so-called because arachnoida refers to spiders. And this looks like a spider webby type of membrane with a space. And in that space also run blood vessels. Is it possible that by communicating bubbles into that space, what you then do is disrupt the space itself and communicate those particular pressure disturbances directly onto the brain tissue? Yes, it is. Is it also possible to communicate that similar form of harmonic frequency to then create reciprocal cavitation within the blood spaces because of the vasculature that exists in the subarachnoid space? Indeed, that is as well. And if you go to the next slide, mechanisms of direct or communicating effects, you can actually see how these effects might then be propagated into the fluid media that surrounds the brain. But wait, there's more. We're talking about the possibility of inducing cavitation in the vasculature, and there's another way that this could happen not just by harmonic communication by virtue of disrupting the subarachnoidal fluid, but also by direct communication into the vascular space. There are a number of blood vessels that provide a perfusion to the inner ear. And we see these in the upper left of this slide talking about focused cavitation of fluid media being blood. The cochlear artery, the vestibular artery, the inferior branch of that are all fed by something called the basilar artery. And the basilar artery then communicates up to the middle cerebral artery, which then launches up into the brain. And one of the dimensions of the cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, is a bunch of finger-like projections that go into the brain space called lacunar arteries. These are very, very small. Lacunar arteries in the middle cerebral artery also branch out to form what's called medullary arteries. Medullary arteries go into the brain space to then provide perfusion to both gray matter and white matter. But you're getting the same type of effect. What you're getting is a fairly large blood vessel, which then narrows down, narrows down yet again. So you're getting a venturi type effect to be able to maintain pressure. And as a consequence, you're seeing increased acceleration of cavitation bubbles. And if, in fact, they burst, the disruption is then going to be amplified. How would you assess this type of thing? I'm not going to go back and reiterate what Dr. Hofer talked about before, but this is basically how you do it. If you want to do it more in a detailed way, what you need to do is from some forensic dissective anatomy, a biopsy or necropsy. You could also model this vitro, in vivo, or with what's called compu simulacra, in other words, utilizing computational simulacra to be able to identify what would be happening in various phantoms. I'm going to leave that discussion to my colleague, Dr. Balaban, who's actually done this work. So what we engage in is something called abductive forensics. Abductive forensics. In other words, given what you got, what could do it? This gives us the idea of best estimate possibilities, and from that, indices of probability. Is it possible? And probable that drugs alone could do this? Highly unlikely. Is it possible and probable that ultrasonics could do this? Yes, it's very possible and it is probable. Is it possible and probable that electromagnetic pulse devices that would then be propagated either directly or vectored could do this? Yes, it's very, very possible and very probable. What about a combinatory approach? Sonic and or electromagnetic pulse generation and perhaps even drugs or toxins that could be given to something to increase the disposition to this. It's quite possible with very strongly positive explanatory value. One other possibility that's looming out there is we might be seeing something else. Now, please, this is very, very tentative and highly putative, and I want to, I want to tell you that. But there has been some talk of late, and my colleague Diane Deulis, my colleague Jen Snow is on the line, have been engaging in these conversations, that modification of existing microbes may produce signs and symptoms that we heretofore have not seen. 
Is it possible that there may be some type of otopathologic or neuropathologic microbe that could have been introduced to these individuals? Is it possible? Yes, it is. Is it probable? No, it's not. A number of reasons for that. Certainly, you're not also seeing the constellation of signs and symptoms that you'd see elsewhere in the body. You're not seeing a white cell response. It would be indicative of some type of immunological orientation to an introduced microbe. And the same thing is true with drugs. The recovery of various drugs or their metabolites is really not one of the salient features of these patients. So again, that takes us back to the abductive reasoning, which would suggest that this is most likely induced by some device that is ultrasonic, electromagnetic pulse, or some combination. Hello, fellow space scholars. I wanted to thank you for being here. This channel started four years ago for many reasons. One of them is that I love to teach and have always wanted to learn how to create video lessons. Another was my frustration at the lack of facts in space news. I wanted to make sure that those truly interested in space science had somewhere to go to learn about the equations that make rockets possible to give you the tools to make your own evaluations of different launch systems. But as important as understanding the equations are, they limit my channel to those with a serious interest in understanding space science. As many of you know, the YouTube algorithm promotes broad topics that are easy to understand. Our space science lessons, however, require a more detailed understanding, and I don't want to dumb the lessons down. But that makes the target audience a lot smaller. To take this channel to the next level will require that I invest more time and resources, and that will require your help. Therefore, I really need your support via Patreon or YouTube membership. Just a little bit every month can make a huge difference, and would be greatly appreciated. I thank you so much, dear friends of Rocket Technology, for your continued support, and I can't tell you how much it means to me. Thank you, and stay safe. Ad Astra Proterra.